Hey guys, Swim here from Team Gwendolyn. Uh This is the start of a new segment that I'm going to be doing, which is every week I will be taking a pretty in-depth look at a deck. And this deck will probably not be a very meta deck, but it will be um, a deck that can achieve very high ranks. For the most part, it's a tier 2 deck, a deck that's a little bit underrated, but really quite solid. Um, this is the deck we're going to be looking at this week, and this is a Queensguard list that I've been tinkering with for the past few days. Uh, you might notice a couple unusual things about this deck, notably uh, the Operator, the Cyprian Wheelie, the Drake Bondu, and maybe some of my Bronze Traces here, as well as the Elsa's Double Cross. These cards, I think, make this deck quite a decent amount more consistent, and it's been working out pretty well for me. This deck has a really, really good time against both Squatel and Hensel, and is able to stand its own against monsters. So, being able to do that well against the top meta decks uh, solidly locks this deck in at tier 2. Uh, right off, these Queen's Guards are the core of the deck, basically. You're, w with these, you're looking to basically put value into the future round, ultimately. Right? You play them, and every round you're able to get them back, and in round three, you know, maybe with some Shieldsmiths, and maybe with the Drake Bondu, although it's a bit unnecessary, you'll hit a Freya that's going to achieve at very, very least 20 points. Now, it can achieve up to something closer to 40 with Operator on either the Drake Bondu or a Queensguard for a fourth one of those. Operator, for the most part, is going to be used on Queensguard, uh, especially in the Monsters matchup, but sometimes you could use it on Drake Bondu if you're wanting to buff up your Queensguards instead of generating more of them, which you might want to do in something like the Squatel matchup specifically. Excuse me. We have the Elzer's Double Cross to facilitate the reliable pulling of the Operator. Very, very important in most decks that rely on Operator to have a good time. And additionally, important with Elzer's Double Cross is you always want to have a backup target to pull with it for the situations where you've already drawn the Operator. In this deck, that backup target is Cyprian Willy. Cyprian Willy is very good in this deck because he is that backup target for the second pull on the Elzer's Double Cross. And he's very good against monsters, banishing Neckers, and monsters is the one faction that this deck doesn't have an, a great win rate against. It's still pretty close to even. Uh, let me actually check here. Yep, it's 50% on my tracker, and it's definitely the weakest of my matchups according to that. So, um, Cyprian Willy is good for that reason. Drake Bondu is good to play early. It's a teeny bit inconsistent, but ultimately very good. You can use in this deck for the same reason as Willy. It increases your win rate against monsters and you don't really need help against other matchups. Uh, Ceres is basically your power finisher here. You're going to be looking to play her in round 3. More often than not. And don't try to overthink her effect. Her, her text is almost 100% useless. She is literally almost a vanilla 8 that Queen's Guards happen to have a relationship to. Uh, you can't really afford, you, you don't really want to end up rezzing her more often than not. It's very disruptible and you end up getting a silver body, which you don't want. So, play her in round 3 99% of the time, although sometimes you do end up rezzing her. Of course, the Raiders, the Brienne, and the Ermion package kind of uh, facilitates further consistency over your Queen's Guards. And in most cases, your opener is going to be something like Operator Queen's Guard, and then you're going to Ermion some excess Queen's Guard, play a Queen's Guard, pull out a bunch of them after using Bran. And you'll take it from there and being able to power through later rounds. This deck has a pretty hard time effectively winning round one, but that's completely okay. Because the way it loses round one is usually very, very good in terms of investments into future rounds. And you can, more often than not, lose round one with this deck on even cards with your opponent and still win the game. That actually happens quite often, often just from the power of the Queen's cards themselves. Uh, in terms of a crafting order, you're basically going to be wanting to craft epics before legendaries. I might hold off on crafting Drake Bondu. He's not super necessary to the list, although the other epics are all great. I would recommend Cyprian Willy, uh, or not necessarily crafting him first, but a lot of people might dismiss him as a bad card. But in this list, he's particularly great. Um, all the epics except for Drake Bondu, and then maybe some legendaries, which would be... Uh Probably Igni Coral, then Roach, and then Ceres, I'm thinking. As well as Operator, probably first. Uh, let's get into some games, see how it plays. 
And here we are against Squirtel. Squirtel is a very good matchup for us. Ultimately, Squirtel has no way to deal with the amount of raw power we have since we don't play it in a way that's too susceptible to uh, Scorch. Now, sometimes they're able to get some high value lacerates, and with a bad hand, you can easily lose. But for the most part, it's a pretty favored matchup. So. We've got um, Operator coming down on Queen of uh, Queen's Guards. We've got Freya's getting kicked out. <sighs> Cyprian and Welly for the Roach. So, kick the Freya first and foremost, as always. We've got the Ermion, so we don't mind the spare Queer and Guards in hand. Uh, could kick an Armorsmith. They can be very, very valuable against the Lacerate or maybe a Manticore Venom. I guess we'll keep it for now. Kick a Scald. And just go back and kick the other Freya here. So we end up drawing a lot of Queen's Guards, but that's okay, because we have the Ermion, so we don't mind having an excess. Well, we'll just open very plainly with the Bran. You can't open with Operator in this matchup, because you just give them a line to Milva. So we'll just Bran through Raiders. No mercy! <clears throat> um, so we've got the Ermion here, kicking out the Queen's Guards. And we can operate one first. Doesn't matter too much the order here. <clears throat> so, he's settling in for a pretty long round with Isengrim and Melena. Um, we can just Wily the Roach too. Doesn't matter too much the order. This deck is very. Th th there's many situations where you have to make very big plays, of course, but this isn't the kind of deck where every single turn is going to require a lot of thought. Um, and that really isn't to say that this deck doesn't take skill. And those are kind of two different things, but yeah, most of your turns will be relatively straightforward. So. Well, Army on here. Uh, we've thinned feel a feel bit like with this, win. and we're putting out Roach, which is great. So, we're drawing into some pretty good cards Shieldsmith and the Scalds. Kick two Queen's Guards out of our hand, and we'll be rising them with the third. Then we've got the fourth one to raise them later. The we would have liked to have Drake Bondu here. Drake Bondu is down. almost in this deck for the uh, Squirtle matchup. It's very, very powerful there. If you operate the Drake Bondu, there's very, very little they can actually do with that really hard for them to do enough. So, I'll play this. Pansy. Very uh, good proactive play that gets some stuff going. He could pass if he's super incentivized to let me take Onward, round one, but it would be a very weird move. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, the crime. I'll just be shield smithing uh, this one. Doesn't matter too much. We're going to be wanting to Shieldsmith the same one again, though, so it's good to do it on the one that's a little bit weakened because it's not going to be too weak for too long. We don't want to buff two different ones with the Shieldsmith because then in later rounds we could give them a good line for Scorch. Whereas if we buff the same one, so, so we're going to have to buff the same one twice, which means it's good to start with a weak one so that it doesn't, you know, start to get um, controllable. There's the Saskia. Coming out a little bit early here, but of course achieving really huge value, as Saskia always does. That being said, my Armorsmith is going to come down here for a really good amount of value, so I'm pretty happy with how this worked out. So, we buff the same one again. It's a 7 and these are 3s, as you can see from my deck tracker. Um, and ultimately, these two have been taken 2 damage, and these two have been taken 1 damage. This has taken 2 damage, so we're basically looking to heal these two, and then any of uh, the 3 units adjacent to them, these, these, or this. We'll see what the Melena hits. But yeah, just keep in mind how Armor Smith works Nothing and what you're going to want to heal from it. Sport. There's the Yaven. The Yaven makes the Armor Smith even more appealing. And I might want to start doing it now before these units start dying off. Although actually, the Queen's Guards dying off isn't really so bad. I can just bring them back. I'll just heal them up now. It doesn't matter whether I place this here or here. It's the same amount of value either way. But 
very, very good card in this case. It came down at like 12, 13 value. You're dead already. So, we're seeing the marksman coming down at 12 fail. and proccing Milena and Isengrim independently. And we'll see a pretty high power coral here. He might not actually have a great answer to this. He has been dragooning. And we know he doesn't have marksman. There's almost a consideration for saving Coral for later. Like, when they buff up a card, it's either marksman, Brian, and those are the two agile targets, or it's archer, vanguard, or maybe a merc, right? They like buffing archers a lot. Now, we haven't seen an archer coming out from him, and I don't think we're necessarily going to. If anything, it's more likely as vanguard, since he's running the Milena build. But, anyway, it's definitely something you want to be aware of. Like, if they have an archer buffed, you can just try to fog preemptively at the end, even if you don't have card advantage. And you so often won't against Squirtel. I'd like to get ahead of him, but it's pretty tricky to do that. I'm just going to get out of this round here. It's quite okay. Now this looks, I mean, it, it does look really quite awful, uh, because he's one card up, and we lost the round. But ultimately, this is just kind of how this matchup goes. Like, it's not so great to be one card down to do so, but losing the round is uneven cards is typically how it goes, and you typically are still fine even after that. I'll make me go first. I'll play Queen's Guard here. You're good. Real good. Loving up Ceres again. And he's already played the Yaven, so his ability to bleed me isn't amazing. He'll play his Queen's Guard here. You're because good. this is a good opportunity Real to good. unload it while I can't pass. Hey, listen to here. The skull. Listen well. He's gonna pull a Shieldsmith. And that sets up some more value into next round. Basically, as long as I can get my score to the point where he doesn't he can't beat it afterwards, I can achieve a really ridiculous amount of value when I fray at the end. In so round three, rather. To a man. So I got one card. So this is extremely telling. The fact that he only had one buff target means the other four cards in his hand are all either gold so cards... What? Should I pound it into a poker? This is the correct one to buff, because it doesn't align them from Scorch uh, this round, and it doesn't set up a big Scorch into the next round. Basically, his other four guards are either specials or golds. He's already played two golds as well, so that's actually incredibly telling. His last cards in his hand are probably Aglaeus, Milva, and Manticore Venom? Something like that? It's definitely a situation where you can infer a lot about their hand. So, I'm going to Coral here. I, I might actually be looking to do a pretty aggressive pass right now, as soon as he plays his last card. It's a tiny bit risky, but it's kind of hard for him to beat that value. Oh, he probably has Scorch in his hand. Yeah. So, I, that was... I should have cleared on that earlier. The odds of him having Scorch in his hand are really high. Cause like, so, instead of Manticore Venom, it's a Scorch. So, it's three out of the following four cards. Iglaeus, Scorch, Manticore Venom, and Milva, basically. That's what we expect to see. Because he hasn't played Scorch yet. And he's not going to get huge value out of it here. If he doesn't pass, I don't actually think he can win this round. I kind of expect him to pass here. He knows I've got to have the balls to pass if he plays, so... I don't think he can beat this. I'm going to pass. Doing a recount. He needs effectively, uh, what is this, 39 points to beat me. It's really hard with the Saskia already having been played. And no matter what he does, if the points are very, very tight, he could actually be risking the one-third chance to lose the Don't game if the Roach goes to the wrong row. Oh, right. I banished the Roach. That's right. You're so, good. It does look really like he good. has a way to beat me here, which is pretty surprising. You'll be fine. I mean, his last card has to basically be a buffed Brian, right? I would expect a Brian. It possibly could be something a little strange, like 
a commando, a vanguard. He kind of has to run vanguard if he's running Milena. Have strength, my love. Hmm. Very big Manticore run there. So his last guard should be able to follow uh, follow up and take him out of the game here. Damn it. Don't like the look of this. Jesus Christ. Kiss bar in there. So we see we're Set against Dagon table. in this and matchup, and Dagon is one of the trickier uh, factions, or rather, Monsters is one of the trickier factions for this deck to play against. Right at the bat, we got Ermion and Igni and Quarrel. We'd love to see all of those, Cyprian, Wily, and Operator. This hand is incredible. And we've got maybe too many Queen's Guard, but that's okay, because we got the Ermion. So we kick the Freya, and we kick the uh, Raider to blacklist it, and then we kick a Queen's Guard. This is almost as good of a hand as we could have. It's very, very powerful. We should see a Necker coming down on him as soon as he's uh, done playing with his crowns. Um, might end up playing Operator first. Uh, Elzer's Double Cross here, now that we've drawn both of our Operator and Cyprian Wily, is just going to be pulling a Shield Smith. Or an Armor Smith, I guess. And we'll open with Operator, see what happens. You'll note that in the Monsters matchup, even if you have Dragomon 2 in your hand, which is as somewhat of an alternative operator target, which you'll opt to take into in some matchups, you will not do that in this matchup, because against monsters who have caretakers, uh, ghouls, catacans, and sometimes griffins, you're really going to want to elect for quantity over quality in terms of your graveyard. So you're going to want the four queen's guards instead of the three big ones. We're going to see a Necker come down, and we're going to see Cyprian Willy uh, just completely obliterate it. And that's basically what this card is for. Cyprian Willy is basically a card that hard counters monsters and can do some good damage against Roach as well in basically every other matchup. And that's great. So, we'll see the brain come down here for Set good value on the table. Raiders. It Let's thins drink. the deck a little bit, which is uh, very relevant Free seeing as we've got Ermion. I would say normally deck bravest. thinning is kind of a little bit overrated, but Ultimately, like when you're actually using cards that draw you cards, like Ermion, deck thinning becomes pretty easy. I might end up drawing Drake Bondu or something. Two Freyas, that's fine. And we'll just kick some Queen's Guards here. So, now we've got uh, the graveyard we want. We've got uh, three Queen's Guards. So we're ready to play Queen's Guard here. This will probably pull a Shieldsmith, uh, which can enable one of them to be buffed, which is nice. <laughs> and we want to save Coral and Igni to basically fend off really, really huge threats. They're kind of our win condition somewhat in this matchup. Very powerful. <clears throat> um, we're not necessarily obligated to use the Skull early. I mean, as Skellige, so this deck has a really hard time really pushing around one, and we don't want to hit the one and four armor smith here, and that would actually suck. Luckily we didn't Come end up doing that. We buffed one of the Queen's Guards. We could always buff Roach, and it would effectively be basically the same result. Although buffing one of the Queen's Guards is less bad uh, in terms of a caretaker, I guess. And it's also protecting them from Igni, which is actually going to become relevant in later rounds as they all grow out into Igni range. So, <clears throat> he's got a pretty powerful board there. Um, it's really hard to push into this round with these two Freya draws off of the Ermion. Uh, we've got Igni to not end up doing that much because that for us would be really good to have a Hunter here. It's unfortunate. That's fine. So, we could drop the Coral here. We would probably see him clear it. Could drop the Igni. Um... His last played as a warrior. Pretty okay with just letting him have it here. He's one card down, and we've got the graveyard here we want, ultimately. That's fine by us. And we can take these uh, much bigger cards for the next round. And of course, as you can see, uh, he's one card down on us. But much more than that, 
He's got a Queen's Guard in his hand. One of the cards in his hand is literally as bad as a Roach. It's a three-point card. It's almost a dead card, and that's very, very important. Because he has, he's going to have a hard time really outvaluing us with that. So we'll Bow open with a Freya here, Freya. and we'll just start resting our Queen's Guards You're again. Good. And you'll see, uh, get, they're not in Igni range yet, but, you know, say next round, uh, if I had buffed them a little more, it's important to keep w one of them staggered above outside of Igni range. <coughs> and in this case, uh, one might look at the sand and be tempted to play Ceres, because I can play Ceres here, and then I can play Freya and, you know, just put more Shieldsmiths on, and then when we go into round three, I can Freya the Queen's Guards and Signature for the Ceres. Although probably not in that order. The problem with that is, well, there's actually a few problems with that. Uh, a, it means she's silver when I actually need her power, which is round three. And it makes her much more vulnerable to Frost. B, uh, makes her vulnerable to Caretaker, which doesn't matter too much in this case. Uh, because I have the, uh, first move since I lost round one. Since you're usually gonna lose round one with this deck, you're usually gonna have the first move in round three. And that's pretty important. So... We'll probably just be fraying out Shieldsmiths here. Uh, I guess we can just do a Scald instead. The wide, somber sea, I will it's a little more value doing a Scald here. Uh, ultimately, Shieldsmithing puts two points into the next round, whereas saving a Freya uh, puts three, because Freya is worth three points plus whatever she reses, which is a Scald in this case. And you want to have uh, good enough bronze targets. That's even more important. You want to populate the graveyard with bronze targets when you're playing Skilliga. Because right now I've got two Freyas in my hand. And I'm going to be raising Queen's Guards. Although if I draw the last Queen's Guards, I'm not even going to do that. And I'm going to want to be able to res targets, right? Because right now all I've got is a Shieldsmith and a Scald. And I'm grateful I put that Scald there. So we'll play this Queen's Guard here. And... This is why we're. This is exactly the situation I was referring to before. Why we're happy we buffed that one up with the uh, Shieldsmith, and this is part of the reason why Shieldsmith is in this deck. Honestly, Shieldsmith is a little bit of an underwhelming card in certain situations, but in this case, it does a really good job. It protects this from a really, really unfortunate Igni in a way that nothing else really could. It's a little unfortunate that we didn't really get to. Um, Sig Drifa before that. We lost a few points to that interaction. We'll be Sig Drifting the Cyprian Wily here, though. And we'll use some of the Necker. And now, the Necker doesn't get banished like it did before, but it doesn't matter, because its base strength is now zero. So when it inevitably gets eaten, which is, you know, by, uh, you know, a Kairin or by an Ekimara or even a Vran, it will not spot another Necker, and that's really hugely important to me. We can just play Ceres here. It's a good nice proactive play. Looks like we're going to be pretty vulnerable to a rain here. Although, he is too. He's eating the Queen's Guard, which is fine. Modern and we'll play Freya reactively patient, here. Or we'll, we'll play proactively no here, insult. basically just uh, resing our cards. And we will just buff this. I mean, we're we're more vulnerable to rain than frost at this point. And we'll just stand out like that. We've got the Igni and the Coral coming out to just do a lot to his ranged and siege rows. Looks like Igni is going to have to be used on the ranged draw if this continues on. And he's already played all of his behemoths and with crones and toads, so it does in fact look like Igni is going to be ranged draw. One kind of slight awkwardness here is that I don't have a great answer to Greyfag, which is kind of weird. I mean, I've got I've got Igni, Coral, and Freya, and I've got the last play, but there's really no way to effectively kill the Greyfag because it won't grow until after I play my last card. Um, it shouldn't be too much of an issue, but we'll see. Mm. We'll probably be looking to Igni this Arrakis Behemoth here, actually. It's a little strange. Let's I'll see about Igni this. this. We've got the Coral to come down on his range, Joe. 
If he has a Grave Hag, that's a little awkward. It puts a pretty uncomfortable amount of power out for him, and I'm pretty susceptible to weathers right now. So, that'll be whatever he wants to dig on. He can't hit both of my rows, but he will have a pretty good pick at whichever one he wants. He's going with rain. Yep. So, if he ends up having Grave Hag, it's going to be really hard no to beat insult. his score here. Our Coral still ends up doing a lot, though. It's ultimately pretty close. I can do a great deal more for you. <clears throat> yep. So that should be just not enough. Um, it's ten points under. I ended up closing the game out, and we weren't able to shut down the Grave And he was able to get a huge value out of his rain plus blocking a lot of value out of being able to be controlled with Karen, but we were still able to outpower him, as this deck pretty often can. <coughs> okay, so in this game, we find ourselves in the Hensalt matchup. Hensalt is a deck that sh we, we should just be able to outpower, and we have a pretty good win rate against it. Let's see how it goes. <coughs> So right off the bat, we've got Queen's Guards, no Operators, we'd like to get rid of these excess Freyas. Uh, drawing too many Freyas is really not so good, and Armorsmith could prove useful in this match as a lot of Fensel players end up running Aeromancy, but we'll see. Worst case scenario, it can heal some Trebuchet damage, which is still good. <coughs> Let's get rid of Freyas. And we've got the Aeromion, so excess Queen's Guards don't bother us even remotely. Let's just keep getting rid of Freyas. Perfect. We end up finding the Operator, which is great. That's exactly what we wanted. And we can just play that here. So, we see Bran. Remaining in our deck in terms of Bran targets are Queen's Guard and three Raiders. And, of course, we're going to army on something like this. Uh, just two of these off. So, we'll Bran right off. Set at my table and let's we want to Bran before we army on because it increases our draws a little bit. And we'll get this raider out of here too. That's it. Good. <clears throat> right. So we can play Ermion here. God's and we can be looking to. Uh, get rid of some of these, and of course Ermion pulls Rich before we draw, which is always good. Now this ADC is hitting Cypher Wily, which is pretty great here. Not incredible, but he should pull a Roach as soon as he ends up promoting his row. And it just allows Cypher to hit some pretty good value. Denying points from later rounds is a mechanic that's basically always going to see value. It has a really, really hard time not doing so. So we could play the Queen's Guards here. Uh, pulling a bunch out here. And we've got the armor smith to hit basically anything in this range. Okay, so right now this armor smith is healing two points. You can actually heal three off the operator so, as well. How are things? <clears throat> so he's lining up for Igni here. We'll take the Igni and Cedro. Sets him back a ways. He doesn't have as many units to play with now. It's a lot more awkward for him in terms of actually uh, getting a really valuable Tell insult. Me you jest. <clears throat> so, he starts to get it back. And again, we're looking at um, a three-point heal on the operator, or a two on the front row. Um, there's a consideration for playing Elsa's Double Cross into Cypher Wily on the King of Beggars, but I'd rather save it for the Roach. They don't even necessarily res the King of Beggars. A good amount of time. So I'll play the Shieldsmith here instead. I'll go ahead and use it on this Queen's Guard. It doesn't matter too much which one, I don't think. And we've got three things to heal with the armor. You one of us or not. And that armor's only gonna get better over time. Tell me you jest. He's gonna use units back there. 
Let's get this coral pulled out. It's hard to find coral value too late in the game against Sensel. You really gotta use it kind of early. I could have actually used it as early as turn one. It might have threatened him into thinking that I had ways of picking off those units that I didn't, which might have made him play kind of awkwardly. But yeah, the more we can pressure him in round one, the better. Coral there achieves very good value because she comes down at six. She knocks these down by five each and these down by three each. So that's a total of 22 value. And that's pretty great. And of course, the rain is still on the board, which means even if he insults it now, which he's maybe inclined to do if he thinks they're under threat, and the units he plays there will still be damaged, which is great for me. This is, of course, what we We'll be putting our, uh, pulling our Cypher in here, <laughs> knocking off that Roach. Now, you can use this on Priscilla. I honestly still like to use it on a Roach, but Priscilla is a very fine target for it, too. And even King of Beggars can be okay sometimes. Just denying those units from being able to come back is a pretty big deal against Northern Realms. Again, Sunsault, as always, as with any deck, you really just want to push them out of round one. Like, even if they win round one, you want to force basically all Let of their tools, what real if you can. Is. Because the more of their combo you can force, the better off you'll be. And I'm only gaining more value by staying in this round one because there's a rain that's very, very powerful for me. I'll be playing a skull hey, here. This is the position listen to put well. the skull that doesn't interfere with this armor smith. I also could have put it right here as well. This might have been a little more resilient towards a round one work, but they never really are in favor of doing that anyway. So he elects to give up round one. We successfully forced him out of the round using our tools of Igni, Coral, he was a little bit greedy, and we just had a lot of pressure going down. Now, we did use some gold cards for that, but Skellige's affection doesn't really need to save onto their golds later. They generally prefer to use their golds in general, uh, broad generalization, but they generally prefer to use their golds a little bit earlier and get more value Modern later with a big patient, fat res, but she such as this. No insult. So this is a really strong play. We might just end up passing off of this. <clears throat> it's typical what we see. Typically, typically what we see. Are you wounded? So Again. he's the neck king. He'll hit the Priscilla here. King of Beggars instead. Who do I king of Beggars means it's hitting a field medic. Tell me you jest. And there's a Trebuchet. But we're still able to force him down one card, and we've got these queenies coming back into round three. I'd like to force out more of his combo, though, if possible. Hence, uh, they can run Bork, and Bork can present a serious problem against this deck. So we would like to force out basically everything we can in this round. Um, it's not too much to hit with Sigdrifa here. Be definitely preferable to save Sigdrifa for round three. Hmm. A little strange. I'll just elect to um, play a Scald here. Don't you pester. Basically, just a decently powerful play. We're really interested in forcing out more of his important tools. We don't want to give him <clears throat> a room to beat me very easily. Shieldsmith for seven points. It's not an incredible Shieldsmith, but it's not so bad. The sea provides. You might not actually mind playing Ceres there. We're only going to be able to summon Roach on either round two or round three here. Uh, pulling Roach out makes the Ceres a 14 pointer, or a, a, sorry, a 20 pointer, which is very powerful. Might be able to force out uh, some of his better cards. See, for example, if we pass now. He'll actually just be able to take it with a Queen's Guard we gave him. We really don't want to do that. In any situation where your opponent has a very weak card in their hand, you don't want to pass when they can play that to beat it. Now, this could be, you know, a Roach from Milva or a Combat Engineer. Just something that just allows them to beat you in a way that they don't really mind doing. And right now, if I pass, that's exactly what he would have. I think I can force out some pretty good cards with the Ceres here. It's hard for him to match this with anything other than a vanilla Yennefer. That should be basically the only thing coming down here. So we see the pork, and we're ready to get out of this round. 
It was very important that we pressured him uh, very, very hard in both round one and two. Uh, round one to force out most of his tools. Round two to just kind of kill them off further, force out the Bork. <laughs> and now in round three, we've just got a really, really ridiculous amount of points coming down with Sigdriff and Queen's Guards, and there's really no top deck that wins at this game. Like, even if he had... Yeah. Even if he had something very, very big, like Aerobmancy, uh, Sigdriff uh, Queen's Guards is still going to be more points than that. So, this game is effectively over. But yeah, uh, the Hensel deck is one that doesn't necessarily do amazingly well against this deck. This deck is just able to just swarm very, very proactive units. And here's the Dragwandu. Drawing it late isn't amazing. It's effectively a 10-point card if you draw it late. Oh, and, you know, with the skill get passive, it's a 12-pointer. Um, I'll just be the playing Sigdrafa here. No reason evil. to draw this out. Pull out a few Queen's Guards. You're good. Real good. And just a really ridiculous amount of points. And of course, Sigdrafa gets buffed by every Queen's Guard that gets rezzed, because they res each other. Anyway, pretty easy and tight matchup. So, after playing all those games, uh, we, we were actually quite lucky we happened to hit uh, one of each of the three most meta decks right now. We played it against Consume Monsters, we played it against Hanselt, and Squatel. And after those, we saw some of what this deck is able to do. This deck is, like I said, very good against Hensel and Squatel because it's just kind of able to outpower what those decks can do. And against Consume Monsters, I would put it at roughly an even matchup. It might be a little bit unfavored, something like 45%, or it might be totally fine. I still need to play it more to be 100% sure. But overall, this deck is very, very potent. This is a solid tier 2 deck, and I would highly recommend this if you're interested in playing Skellige right now. This is one of the strongest decks you have available to you as a Skellige player. And I will see you guys next time.